does not exist cannot be defined, but Boethius, Constellation of Philosophy, 4, defines fate thus. Fate is a disposition inherent to changeable things, by which providence connects each one with its proper order. I answer that, in this world, some things seem to happen by luck or chance. Now, it happens sometimes that something is lucky or chance-like as compared to inferior causes, which, if compared to some higher cause, is directly intended. For instance, if two servants are sent by their master to the same place, the meeting of the two servants in regard to themselves is by chance, but, as compared to the master, who had ordered it, it is directly intended. So, there were some who refused to refer to a higher cause such events which, by luck or chance, take place here below. These denied the existence of fate and providence, as Augustine relates of Tully, the city of God, 5, 9. And this is contrary to what we have said above about providence, question 22, article 2. On the other hand, some have considered that everything that takes place here below by luck or by chance, whether in natural things or in human affairs, is to be reduced to a superior cause namely, the heavenly bodies. According to these, fate is nothing else than a disposition of the stars under which each one is begotten or born. See St. Augustine, the City of God, 5, 1, 8, and 9. But this will not hold. First, as to human affairs, because we have proved above, question 115, article 4, that human actions are not subject to the action of heavenly bodies, save accidentally and indirectly. Now the cause of fate, since it has the ordering of things that happen by fate, must of necessity be directly and of itself the cause of what takes place. Secondly, as to all things that happen accidentally, for it has been said, question 115, article 6, that what is accidental is properly speaking neither a being nor a unity. But every action of nature terminates in some one thing. Wherefore it is impossible for that which is accidental to be the proper effect of an active natural principle. No natural cause can therefore have for its proper effect that a man intending to dig a grave finds a treasure. Now it is manifest that A acts after the manner of a natural principle, wherefore its effects in this world are natural. It is therefore impossible that any active power of a heavenly body be the cause of what happens by accident here below, whether by luck or by chance. We must therefore say that what happens here by accident, both in natural things and in human affairs, is reduced to a preordaining cause, which is divine providence for nothing hinders that which happens by accident being considered as one by an intellect. Otherwise the intellect could not form this proposition. The digger of a grave found a treasure. And just as an intellect can apprehend this, so can it affect it. For instance, someone who knows a place where a treasure is hidden might instigate a rustic, ignorant of this, to dig a grave there. Consequently, nothing hinders what happened here by accident, by luck or by chance, being reduced to some ordering cause which acts by the intellect, especially the divine intellect. For God alone can change the will, as shown above, question 105, article 4. Consequently, the ordering of human actions, the principle of which is the will, must be ascribed to God alone. So, therefore, inasmuch as all that happens here below is subject to divine providence, as being preordained, and as it were, forespoken, we can admit the existence of fate, although the holy doctors avoided the use of this word on account of those who twisted its application to a certain force in the position of the stars. Hence Augustine says, the city of God, 5.1, If anyone ascribes human affairs to fate, meaning thereby the will or power of God, let him keep to his opinion, but hold his tongue. For this reason Gregory denies the existence of fate, wherefore the first objection solution is manifest. Reply Objection 2 Nothing hinders certain things happening by luck or by chance if compared to their proximate causes, but not if compared to divine providence, whereby nothing happens at random in the world, as Augustine says. Eighty-three different questions. Question 24. Second article. Whether fate is in created things. Objection 1. It would seem that fate is not in created things, for Augustine says, the city of God, 5.1, that the divine will or power is called fate. But the divine will or power is not in creatures but in God, therefore fate is not in creatures but in God. Objection 2. Further, fate is compared to things that happen by fate, as their cause, as the very use of the word proves. The sole cause that of itself affects what takes place by accident here below is God alone, as stated above, Article 1. Therefore, fate is in God, and not in creatures. Objection 3. Further, if fate is in creatures, it is either a substance or an accident, and whichever it is, it must be multiplied according to the number of creatures. Since, therefore, fate seems to be one thing only, it seems that the fate is not in creatures, but in God. 
On the contrary, Boethius says, Consolation of Philosophy, for fate is a disposition inherent to changeable things. I answer that, as is clear from what has been stated above, question 22, article 3, and question 103, article 6, divine providence produces effects through mediate causes. We can therefore consider the ordering of the effects in two ways. Firstly, as being in God himself, and thus the ordering of the effects is called providence. But if we consider this ordering as being in the mediate causes ordered by God to the production of certain effects, thus it has the nature of fate. This is what Boethius says, Consolation of Philosophy 4. Fate is worked out when divine providence is served by certain spirits, whether by the soul or by all nature itself which obeys him, whether by the heavenly movements of the stars, whether by the angelic power, or by the ingenuity of the demons, whether by some of these, or by all, the chain of fate is forged. Of each of these things we have spoken above, Article 1, Question 104, Article 2, Question 110, Article 1, Question 113, and Question 114. It is therefore manifest that fate is in the created causes themselves, as ordered by God to the production of their effects. Reply Objection 1. The ordering itself of second causes, which Augustine, the City of God, 5.8, calls the series of causes, has not the nature of fate except as dependent on God. Wherefore the divine power or will can be called fate as being the cause of fate, but essentially, fate is the very disposition or series, i.e., order of second causes. Reply Objection 2. Fate has the nature of a cause, just as much as the second causes themselves, the ordering of which is called fate. Reply Objection 3. Fate is called a disposition, not that disposition which is a species of quality, but in the sense in which it signifies order, which is not a substance but a relation. And if this order be considered in relation to its principle, it is one, and thus fate is one. But if it be considered in relation to its effects, or to the mediate causes, this fate is multiple. In this sense the poet wrote, Thy fate draws thee. Third article. Whether fate is unchangeable. Objection 1. It seems that fate is not unchangeable, for Boethius says, Consolation of Philosophy 4, As reasoning is to the intellect, as the begotten is to that which is, as time to eternity, as the circle to its center, so is the fickle chain of fate to the unwavering simplicity of providence. Objection 2. Further, the philosopher says, Topics 2.7. If we be moved, what is in us is moved. But fate is a disposition inherent to changeable things, as Boethius says, Consolation of Philosophy 4. Therefore fate is changeable. Objection 3. Further, if fate is unchangeable, what is subject to fate happens unchangeably and of necessity. But things ascribed to fate seem principally to be contingencies. Therefore, there would be no contingencies in the world, but all things would happen of necessity. On the contrary, Boethius says, Consolation of Philosophy 4, that fate is an unchangeable disposition. I answer that the disposition of second causes which we call fate can be considered in two ways. Firstly, in regard to the second causes which are thus disposed or ordered. Secondly, in regard to the first principle, namely, God, by whom they are ordered. Some, therefore, have held that the series itself of dispositions of causes is in itself necessary, so that all things would happen of necessity, for this reason that each effect has a cause, and, given a cause, the effect must follow of necessity. But this is false, as proved above. Question 115, Article 6. Others, on the other hand, held that fate is changeable, even as dependent on divine providence, Wherefore the Egyptians said that fate could be changed by certain sacrifices, as Gregory of Nyssa says, Nemesius de homine. This too has been disproved above for the reason that it is repugnant to divine providence. We must therefore say that fate, considered in regard to second causes, is changeable, but as subject to divine providence it derives a certain unchangeableness, not of absolute but of conditional necessity. In this sense we say that this conditional is true and necessary. If God foreknew that this would happen, it will happen. Wherefore Boethius, having said that the chain of fate is fickle, shortly afterwards adds, which, since it is derived from an unchangeable providence, must also itself be unchangeable. From this the answers to the objections are clear. Fourth article. Whether all things are subject to fate. Objection 1. It seems that all things are subject to fate, for Boethius says, Consolation of Philosophy 4, the chain of fates moves the heaven and the stars, tempers the elements to one another, and models them by reciprocal transformation. 
by fate all things that are born into the world and perish are renewed in a uniform progression of offspring and seed nothing therefore seems to be excluded from the domain of fate objection to further augustine says the city of god five one that fate is something real as referred to the divine will and power but the divine will is cause of all things that happen as augustine says on the trinity three one and what follows therefore all things are subject to fate objection three further boethius says consolation of philosophy four that fate is a disposition inherent to changeable things but all creatures are changeable and god alone is truly unchangeable as stated above question nine article two therefore fate is in all things on the contrary boethius says consolation of philosophy four that some things subject to providence are above the ordering of fate i answer that as stated above article two fate is the ordering of second causes to effects foreseen by god whatever therefore is subject to second causes is subject also to fate but whatever is done immediately by god since it is not subject to second causes neither is it subject to fate such are creation the glorification of spiritual substances and the like and this is what boethius says consolation of philosophy four namely that those things which are nigh to god have a state of immobility and exceed the changeable order of fate hence it is clear that the further a thing is from the first mind the more it is involved in the chain of fate since so much the more is bound up with second causes reply objection one all the things mentioned in this passage are done by god by means of second causes for this reason they are contained in the order of fate but it is not the same with everything else as stated above reply objection two fate is to be referred to the divine will and power as to its first principle consequently it does not follow that whatever is subject to the divine will or power is subject also to fate as already stated reply objection three although all creatures are in some way changeable yet some of them do not proceed from changeable created causes and these therefore are not subject to fate as stated above end of question one hundred and sixteen question one hundred seventeen of summa theologica pars prima on the divine government this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Summa Theologica Pars Prima, On the Divine Government, by St. Thomas Aquinas, translated by the Fathers of the English Dominican Province, Question 117, Of Things Pertaining to the Action of Man. Article 1. Whether One Man Can Teach Another. Objection 1. It would seem that one man cannot teach another. For the Lord says, in Matthew 22, 8, Be not you called rabbi. On which the gloss of Jerome says, Lest you give to man the honor due to God. Therefore, to be a master is properly an honor due to God. But it belongs to a master to teach. Therefore man cannot teach, and this is proper to God. Objection 2. Further, if one man teaches another, this is only inasmuch as he acts through his own knowledge, so as to cause knowledge in the other. But a quality, through which any one acts, so as to produce his like, is an active quality. Therefore it follows that knowledge is an active quality just as heat is. Objection 3. Further, for knowledge we require intellectual light, and the species of the thing understood. But a man cannot cause either of these in another man. Therefore, a man cannot, by teaching, cause knowledge in another man. Objection 4. Further, the teacher does nothing in regard to a disciple save to propose to him certain signs, so as to signify something by words or gestures. But it is not possible to teach anyone so as to cause knowledge in him by putting signs before him for these are signs either of things that he knows or of things he does not know if of things that he knows he to whom those signs are proposed is already in the possession of knowledge and does not acquire it from the master if they are signs of things that he does not know he can learn nothing therefrom for instance if one were to speak greek to a man who only knows latin he would learn nothing thereby therefore in no way can a man cause knowledge in another by teaching him. On the contrary, the Apostle says, in 1 Timothy 2.7, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle, a doctor of the Gentiles in faith and truth. 
I answer that, on this question there have been various opinions. For Averroes, commenting on On the Soul 3, maintains that all men have one passive intellect, in common, as stated above in question 76, article 2. From this it follows that the same intelligible species belong to all men. Consequently, he held that one man does not cause another to have a knowledge distinct from that which he has himself, but that he communicates the identical knowledge which he has himself, by moving him to order rightly the phantasms in his soul, so that they may be rightly disposed for intelligible apprehension. This opinion is true so far as knowledge is the same in disciple and master, if we consider the identity of the thing known, for the same objective truth is known by both of them. But, so far as he maintains that all men have but one passive intellect, and the same intelligible species, differing only as to various phantasms, his opinion is false, as stated above in question 76, article 2. Besides this, there is the opinion of the Platonists, who held that our souls are possessed of knowledge from the very beginning, through the participation of separate forms, as stated above in question 84, article 3 and 4. But that the soul is hindered through its union with the body, from the free consideration of those things which it knows. According to this, the disciple does not acquire fresh knowledge from his master, but is roused by him to consider what he knows, so that to learn would be nothing else than to remember. In the same way they held that natural agents only dispose matter to receive forms, which matter requires by a participation of separate substances. But against this we have proved above in question 79, article 2, and question 84, article 3, that the passive intellect of the human soul is in pure potentiality to intelligible species, as Aristotle says in On the Soul 3, 4. We must therefore decide the question differently, by saying that the teacher causes knowledge in the learner by reducing him from potentiality to act, as the philosopher says in Physics 8, 4. In order to make this clear, we must observe that of effects proceeding from an exterior principle, some proceed from the exterior principle alone, as the form of a house is caused to be in matter by art alone, whereas other effects proceed sometimes from an exterior principle, sometimes from an interior principle. Thus, health is caused in a sick man, sometimes by an exterior principle, namely by the medical art, sometimes by an interior principle, as when a man is healed by the force of nature. In these latter effects two things must be noticed. First, that art in its work imitates nature, for just as nature heals a man by alteration, digestion, rejection of the matter that caused the sickness, so does art. Secondly, we must remark that the exterior principle, art, acts, not as a principal agent, but as helping the principal agent, which is the interior principle, and by strengthening it, and by furnishing it with instruments and assistance, of which the interior principle makes use in producing the effect. Thus the physician strengthens nature, and employs food and medicine, of which nature makes use for the intended end. Now, it is acquired in man, both from an interior principle, as is clear in one who procures knowledge by his own research, and from an exterior principle, as is clear in one who learns by instruction. For in every man there is a certain principle of knowledge, namely the light of the active intellect, through which certain universal principles of all the sciences are naturally understood as soon as proposed to the intellect. Now, when anyone applies these universal principles to certain particular things, the memory or experience of which he acquires through the senses, then by his own research advancing from the known to the unknown, he obtains knowledge of what he knew not before. Wherefore, anyone who teaches leads the disciple from things known by the latter to the knowledge of things previously unknown to him, according to which the philosopher says in Posterior Analytics 1.1, all teaching and all learning proceed from previous knowledge. Now, the master leads the disciple from things known to knowledge of the unknown in a twofold manner. Firstly, by proposing to him certain helps or means of instruction, which his intellect can use for the acquisition of science, 
For instance, he may put before him certain less universal propositions, of which nevertheless the disciple is able to judge from previous knowledge, or he may propose to him some sensible examples, either by way of likeness or of opposition, or something of the sort, from which the intellect of the learner is led to the knowledge of truth previously known. Secondly, by strengthening the intellect of the learner, not indeed by some act of power as of a higher nature, as explained above in question 106, article 1, and question 111, article 1, of the angelic enlightenment, and because all human intellects are of one grade in the natural order, but inasmuch as he proposes to the disciple the order of principles to conclusions, and by reason of his not having sufficient collating power yet to be able to draw the conclusions from the principles. Hence the philosopher says in Posterior Analytics 1-2 that a demonstration is a syllogism that causes knowledge. In this way a demonstrator causes his hearer to know. Reply to Objection 1. As stated above, the teacher only brings exterior help as the physician who heals. But just as the interior nature is the principal cause of the healing, so the interior light of the intellect is the principal cause of knowledge. But both of these are from God. Therefore, as of God it is written, Who healeth all thy diseases, Psalm 102.3, so of him it is written, He that teacheth man knowledge, Psalm 93.10, inasmuch as the light of his countenance is signed upon us, Psalm 4.7, through which light all things are shown to us. Reply to Objection 2. As Averroes argues, the teacher does not cause knowledge in the disciple after the manner of a natural act of cause. Wherefore, knowledge need not be an act of quality, but is the principle by which one is directed in teaching, just as art is the principle by which one is directed in working. Reply to Objection 3. The master does not cause the intellectual light in the disciple, nor does he cause the intelligible species directly, but he moves the disciple by teaching so that the latter, by the power of his intellect, forms intelligible concepts, the signs of which are proposed to him from without. Reply to Objection 4. The signs proposed by the Master to the disciple are of things known in a general and confused manner, but not known in detail and distinctly. Therefore, when anyone acquires knowledge by himself, he cannot be called self-taught, or be said to have his own master, because perfect knowledge did not precede in him such as is required in a master. Article 2. Whether man can teach the angels. Objection 1. It would seem that men teach angels. For the Apostle says, in Ephesians 3.10, that the manifold wisdom of God may be made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places through the church. But the church is the union of all the faithful. Therefore, some things are made known to angels through men. Objection 2. Further, the superior angels, who are enlightened immediately concerning divine things by God, can instruct the inferior angels, as stated above in question 116, article 1, and question 112, article 3. But some men are instructed immediately concerning divine things, and by the word of God, as appears principally of the apostles, from Hebrews 1, 1, and 2. Last of all, in those days, God hath spoken to us by his Son. Therefore, some men have been able to teach the angels. Objection 3. Further, the inferior angels are instructed by the superior, but some men are higher than some angels, since some men are taken up to the highest angelic orders, as Gregory says in a homily, homily 34 on the Gospels. Therefore, some of the inferior angels can be instructed by men concerning divine things. On the contrary, Dionysius says in On the Divine Names 4, that every divine enlightenment is born to men by the ministry of the angels. Therefore, angels are not instructed by men concerning divine things. I answer that, as stated above in question 107, article 2, the inferior angels can indeed speak to the superior angels by making their thoughts known to them. But concerning divine things, superior angels are never enlightened by inferior angels. Now, it is manifest that in the same way as inferior angels are subject to the superior, the highest men are subject even to the lowest angels. 
This is clear from our Lord's words in Matthew 11:11. 11, 11. There hath not risen among them that are born of woman a greater than John the Baptist, yet he that is lesser in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Therefore angels are never enlightened by men concerning divine things, but men can by means of speech make known to angels the thoughts of their hearts, because it belongs to God alone to know the heart's secrets. Reply to Objection 1. Augustine, in On the Literal Interpretation of Genesis 5.19, thus explains this passage of the Apostle, who in the preceding verses says, To me, the least of all the saints, is given this grace, to enlighten all men, that they may see what is the dispensation of the mystery which hath been hidden from eternity in God. Hidden, yet so that the multiform wisdom of God was made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, that is, through the church. As though he were to say, This mystery was hidden from men, but not from the church in heaven, which is contained in the principalities and powers who knew it from all ages, but not before all ages, because the church was at first there, where after the resurrection this church composed of men will be gathered together. It can also be explained otherwise that what is hidden is known by the angels, not only in God, but also here, where when it takes place and is made public, as Augustine says further on in, in On the Literal Interpretation of Genesis 5.19. Thus, when the mysteries of Christ in the church were fulfilled by the apostles, some things concerning these mysteries became apparent to the angels, which were hidden from them before. In this way, we can understand what Jerome says in his commentary on the Epistle to the Ephesians, that from the preaching of the apostles, the angels learned certain mysteries. That is to say, through the preaching of the apostles, the mysteries were realized in the things themselves. Thus, by the preaching of Paul, the Gentiles were converted, of which mystery the apostle is speaking in the passage quoted. Reply to Objection 2. The apostles were instructed immediately by the word of God, not according to his divinity, but according as he spoke in his human nature. Hence the argument does not prove. Reply to Objection 3. Certain men in this state of life are greater than certain angels, not actually, but virtually, forasmuch as they have such great charity that they can merit a higher degree of beatitude than that possessed by certain angels. In the same way, we might say that the seed of a great tree is virtually greater than a small tree, though actually it is much smaller. Article 3. Whether man, by the power of his soul, can change corporeal matter. Objection 1. It would seem that man, by the power of his soul, can change corporeal matter. For Gregory says in his Dialogues 2.30, Saints work miracles sometimes by prayer, sometimes by their power. Thus Peter by prayer raised the dead Tabitha to life, and by his reproof delivered to death the line Ananias and Sapphira. But, in the working of miracles, a change is wrought in corporeal matter. Therefore, men, by the power of the soul, can change corporeal matter. Objection 2. Further, on these words, Galatians 3.1, Who hath bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth, the gloss says that some have blazing eyes, who by a single look bewitch others, especially children. But this would not be unless the power of the soul could change corporeal matter. Therefore, man can change corporeal matter by the power of his soul. Objection 3. Further, the human body is nobler than other inferior bodies. But, by the apprehension of the human soul, the human body is changed to heat and cold, as appears when a man is angry or afraid. Indeed, this change sometimes goes so far as to bring on sickness and death. Much more, then, can the human soul by its power change corporeal matter. On the contrary, Augustine says in On the Trinity 3.8, Corporeal matter obeys God alone at will. I answer that, as stated above in question 110, article 2, corporeal matter is not changed to, the reception of, a form save either by some agent composed of matter and form, or by God himself, in whom both matter and form pre-exist virtually, as in the primordial cause of both. Wherefore, of the angels also we have stated, question 110, article 2, 
that they cannot change corporeal matter by their natural power, except by employing corporeal agents for the production of certain effects. Much less, therefore, can the soul, by its natural power, change corporeal matter, except by means of bodies. Reply to Objection 1. The saints are said to work miracles by the grace of God, not of nature. This is clear from what Gregory says in the same place. Those who are the sons of God, in power, as John says, what wonder is there that they should work miracles by that power? Reply to Objection 2. Avicenna assigns the cause of bewitchment to the fact that corporeal matter has a natural tendency to obey spiritual substance rather than natural contrary agents. Therefore, when the soul is of a strong imagination, it can change corporeal matter. This, he says, is the cause of the evil eye. But it has been shown above, in question 110, article 2, that corporeal matter does not obey spiritual substances at will, but the Creator alone. Therefore, it is better to say that by a strong imagination the corporeal spirits of the body united to that soul are changed, which change in the spirits takes place especially in the eyes, to which the more subtle spirits can reach. And the eyes infect the air which is in contact with them to a certain distance. In the same way as a new and clear mirror contracts a tarnish from the look of a menstruata, as Aristotle says in On Sleep and Waking too. Hence, when a soul is vehemently moved to wickedness, as occurs mostly in little old women, according to the above explanation, the countenance becomes venomous and hurtful, especially to children, who have a tender and most impressionable body. It is also possible that by God's permission, or from some hidden deed, the spiteful demons cooperate in this, as the witches may have some compact with them. Reply to Objection 3. The soul is united to the body as its form, and the sensitive appetite, which obeys the reason in a certain way, as stated above in question 81, article 3, it is the act of a corporeal organ. Therefore, at the apprehension of the human soul, the sensitive appetite must needs be moved with an accompanying corporeal operation. But the apprehension of the human soul does not suffice to work a change in exterior bodies, except by means of a change in the body united to it, as stated above, in reply to objection 2. Article 4. Whether the separate human soul can move bodies at least locally? Objection 1. It seems that the separate human soul can move bodies, at least locally. For a body naturally obeys a spiritual substance as to local motion, as stated above in question 110, article 5. But the separate soul is a spiritual substance. Therefore, it can move exterior bodies by its command. Objection 2. Further, in the itinerary of Clement, it is said in the narrative of Nicetus to Peter, that Simon Magnus, by sorcery, retained power over the soul of a child that he had slain, and that through this soul he worked magical wonders. But this could not have been, without some corporeal change at least as to place. Therefore, the separate soul has the power to move bodies locally. On the contrary, the philosopher says in On the Soul 1.3 that the soul cannot move any other body whatsoever but its own. I answer that, the separate soul cannot by its natural power move a body, for it is manifest that, even while the soul is united to the body, it does not move the body except as endowed with life, so that if one of the members become lifeless, it does not obey the soul as to local motion. Now, it is also manifest that no body is quickened by the separate soul. Therefore, within the limits of its natural power, the separate soul cannot command the obedience of a body, though and by the power of God, it can exceed those limits. Reply to Objection 1. There are certain spiritual substances whose powers are not determinate to certain bodies. Such are the angels, who are naturally unfettered by a body. Consequently, various bodies may obey them as to movement. But if the motive power of a separate substance is naturally determinate to move a certain body, that substance will not be able to move a body of higher degree, but only one of lower degree. Thus, according to philosophers, the mover of the lower heaven cannot move the higher heaven. 
Wherefore, since the soul is by its nature determinate to move the body of which it is the form, it cannot by its natural power move any other body. Reply to Objection 2 as Augustine, in The City of God, 10.11, and Chrysostom, in his homily 28 on Matthew, say, the demons often pretend to be the souls of the dead, in order to confirm the error of heathen superstition. It is therefore credible that Simon Magnus was deceived by some demon who pretended to be the soul of the child whom the magician had slain. End of question 117 power of a heavenly body be the cause of what happens by accident here below, whether by luck or by chance. We must therefore say that what happens here by accident, both in natural things and in human affairs, is reduced to a preordaining cause, which is divine providence, for nothing hinders that which happens by accident being considered as one by an intellect. Otherwise the intellect could not form this proposition. The digger of a grave found a treasure. And just as an intellect can apprehend this, so can it affect it. For instance, someone who knows a place where a treasure is hidden might instigate a rustic, ignorant of this, to dig a grave there. Consequently, nothing hinders what happened here by accident, by luck or by chance, being reduced to some ordering cause which acts by the intellect, especially the divine intellect, for God alone can change the will. As These deny the existence of fate and providence, as Augustine relates of Tully, the city of God, 5, 9. And this is contrary to what we have said above about providence. Question 22, Article 2. On the other hand, some have considered that everything that takes place here below by luck or by chance, whether in natural things or in human affairs, is to be reduced to a superior cause, namely the heavenly bodies. According to these, fate is nothing else than a disposition of the stars under which each one is begotten or born. See St. Augustine, the City of God, 5, 1, 8, and 9. But this will not hold. First, as to human affairs, because we have proved above, question 115, article 4, that human actions are not sub does not exist cannot be defined, but Boethius, Constellation of Philosophy, 4, defines fate thus. Fate is a disposition inherent to changeable things, by which providence connects each one with its proper order. I answer that, in this world, some things seem to happen by luck or chance. Now, it happens sometimes that something is lucky or chance-like as compared to inferior causes, which, if compared to some higher cause, is directly intended. For instance, if two servants are sent by their master to the same place, the meeting of the two servants in regard to themselves is by chance, but as compared to the master who had ordered it, it is directly intended. So there were some who refused to refer to a higher cause such events which, by luck or chance, take place here below, as shown above, Question 105, Article 4. Consequently, the ordering of human actions, the principle of which is the will, must be ascribed to God alone. So, therefore, inasmuch as all that happens here below is subject to divine providence, as being preordained, and as it were, forespoken, we can admit the existence of fate, although the holy doctors avoided the use of this word on account of those who twisted its application to a certain force in the position of the stars. Hence Augustine says, The City of God, 5.1, if anyone ascribes human affairs to fate, meaning thereby the will or power of God, let him keep to his opinion, but hold his tongue. For this reason Gregory denies the existence of fate, wherefore the first objection solution is manifest. Reply object to the action of heavenly bodies, save accidentally and indirectly. Now the cause of fate, since it has the ordering of things that happen by fate, must of necessity be directly and of itself the cause of what takes place. Secondly, as to all things that happen accidentally, for it has been said, question 115, article 6, that what is accidental is properly speaking neither a being nor a unity. But every action of nature terminates in some one thing. Wherefore it is impossible for that which is accidental to be the proper effect of an active natural principle. No natural cause can therefore have for its proper effect that a man intending to dig a grave finds a treasure. Now it is manifest that A acts after the manner of a natural principle, wherefore its effects in this world are natural. It is therefore impossible that any act 